Okay, tonight we're going to talk about, last week we talked about the Old Testament, and tonight we're going to go ahead and go further in the New Testament. So I need someone who has a Bible open and, and ready to, uh, when it comes to the point um, in the opening prayer, which you should be on the top of your packet, I um, read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. children come before you today in need of your love and understanding. As we bring ourselves before you, hear our prayers and guide us so that we, we may show that we may show your greatness to all. We ask that each of us find your spirit within us today, that we may celebrate Christ with all our being. Father, awaken your spirit in us. We ask that our community rejoice in the goodness and love that your son's coming brings. Father, open our minds and our hearts. We ask that we may be able to take the joy and love we celebrate here to others who live among us. Father, be with us. And Father, we ask too that the world may be open to you, that peace may reign, and that your love and your word may someday find no barrier. The Lord is our God, and we are his people. Let us join in saying the prayer our Savior taught us. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. And we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you looking for Alpha? In the gym. You may have to go. Did they have to go in the other door? I forgot the... Uh, 
or a bride. Okay. Can anybody can anybody say her name? Mm -hmm. On the back? Stacy, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Awesome. Okay. Tonight we're going to uh, talk about the New Testament. Particular computer does not like the font that I use on my um, computer at home. And it's always kind of weird looking, so I apologize for that ahead of time. So, we're going to talk about the New Testament, the Christian scripture. But I think we need to just kind of do a review from last week. So, first of all, are there any questions left over from last week? covered a great deal of material um, over a short period of time, and so is there anything that you thought of afterwards, or you thought whatever she said, you know, uh, maybe you need it again? Was it all too much? <laughs> we did cover a lot. Well, I'm going to review a little bit of it um, to go over it. So, first of all... <coughs> Unequivocally, the Bible is the Word of God. It's God's love story to us. It's it's full of faith stories. And so, it, first of all, we have to remember that nothing was written in the beginning. Everything was just oral tradition. They were nomadic tribes. They were traversing that whole area. And so nothing was written down. Everything God revealed to them was oral tradition. So you had only oral tradition first. It wasn't until they settled down, because they couldn't carry, they were, they, anything written, first of all, most of them were illiterate. They were just a few that had learned to read and write here and there. Um, but they had to write it on skins, which were really heavy. And so you couldn't go lugging that around with everything else you had. So they didn't have anything written. Everything was oral tradition. Um, the Bible, like I said, didn't come down intact like we see it today. It's from the word biblia, which means books, many books. And not just one book, but many books. And they can they include a lot of a lot of different books um, written by different authors over a period of probably about a thousand years. So the authors it were inspired by God. They only wrote what God wanted them to write. Uh, but they used their own language, their own culture, their own experience, things that they would be very familiar with, and the people they were writing it for would be also familiar with those things. But they only wrote what God revealed to them and what God's message was and what God was wanted written. But he didn't stand over them like a like a puppeteer, you know, saying move this way at strings and everything. He he revealed himself to them and allowed them to use their language and their culture to put this down and when they started writing. Or when they were talking, when they had their oral tradition. One thing the Bible is not, it's not a science book. It's not meant to be. It has some historical facts in it, but it's not meant to be a history book. You can't just follow it like you do books today in a certain order. 
when we get to the New Testament, it's not meant to be a biography either. Because when we get to the New Testament, we're going to see what biographies look like today are not what the Gospels look like. So it's neither one of those. What it is is full of faith stories, faith in the, the, the revelation that God gave us for our salvation so that we could have eternal life with him. And so these stories were faith stories. The Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew and some in Greek. Uh, the New Testament, primarily in Greek. One thing about Hebrew that makes it very difficult is not only is it, is it written from right to left, there are no vowels in Hebrew. So the person who's translating it needed to have an excellent education in Hebrew and also in Greek and knowledge of the culture and the oral tradition of the people in order to be able to do a, a, a very good translation. And St. Jerome did the first translation in Latin uh, using that because he had knowledge. He was very well educated in all of the different languages, had this great historical background, and so he was the excellent person the Pope chose to, and one, at about 150, no, about longer than that, almost 400 AD, to translate the Bible uh, into Latin. Then that was called the Vulgate. And that was the primary um, Bible that included both the Old Testament and the New Testament in it that was used for a long period of time. The other thing that was difficult um, was that not only was it in Hebrew and then in Greek, but it wasn't broken down into chapters like we have today or verses. So if you're trying to find something, you really had to know the scriptures. You had to know where they were. Like I mentioned last week, I took a tour of the Hillel Foundation uh, with some seventh graders in my class one year. And they showed us the scrolls that they have. The, for the Jewish people, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, the law, that's like we cherish our Gospels. For them, that is the law. You have the first five books. In fact, a lot of the Jewish community, that's all they wanted. That's all they needed. That was the law. That's what they followed. The others were good faith stories and how to put it into a text of the prophets and so on. But the, the Torah. So he took down one of the scrolls for us and, and showed it to us. And um, he said because it wasn't broken down into chapters or verse, he would always go to the Ten Commandments because he said it would be written, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, and he could find that, and he would go either forward from that or backwards from that if he was reading from, from the, the scriptures. And so that was, he had to look for something like that because it, it was, it's very difficult. He didn't, certainly didn't have page numbers like we just talked about, and we're so used to chapter and verse to, to help us find a scripture passage, they didn't have that either. 12, 26 before they had chapters, and 15, 51 before it had verses. They're also going to find in one thing that um, when I, John and I were talking about it, one of the things you're going to find is that in the different, some of the different translations, like in Psalms, the numbering isn't always in order, or there might be a number of a verse missing. I know there's one psalm, I can't remember which one it is, it's there you see verse 14, 15, 17, 18, 15, maybe. So you're going to find some that the, the newer translation went, this one really, that verse really belongs here and then here, but they would keep the verse numbers or they would just omit that verse number. So you're going to find a few idiosyncrasies, not many, but you're going to find it in different translations of the Bible. Has anybody ever run into that? John had. Mm -hmm. Laura? Yeah. So if you get to that, don't panic. It's just that it, it's not that there's anything incorrect. It's just that that translator chose to move it 
kept the same verse number but chose to move it just because it made more sense in that order. Okay? So when we look at it, um, the, the two testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, or the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, testament means the covenant, the covenant God made with his people or an agreement. A covenant is just a um, holy agreement is what it is. So the two, two different um, covenants, the two different testaments, are, are this, this agreement, this covenant that God has given us. One other thing that we're going to find in the New Testament is that there's a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament. And these prophecies are all fulfilled in the New Testament. So you, it's really important that we don't just discard the Old Testament like it's something old and not worthy because that gives us the background and the history that we need to really understand the New Testament and, and the fullness of, of what it has to share with us because it fulfills the Old Testament and particularly the prophecies. We can see them fulfilled when we know what they are and we know what we're looking for. So it's really important that we spend time with both. When you're just starting to read, don't do what I do, did and just open it up like any other book and say, well, you start with page one, so that's how you do it. And you go to Genesis and you get to all of the gaps and all the other kind of things and you say, I have no idea what's going on. So if you're just beginning to sit down and read scripture, start with the Gospels. Start in the New Testament. Start with the Gospels. It'll be something you've heard, you're familiar with, and you can begin there. And that's the story of who Jesus is. So it's a beautiful place to begin anyway. Um, and then I, I'm doing a Bible study right now that I, I facilitate, and we're doing Genesis. So we're really getting started at the beginning and getting into it. And I'm beginning to understand what all those big ass were and everything. So it, it helps when you have a good... Bible study and a good commentary to help break open some of those scriptures too. So don't ignore, most good Bibles will have a really good commentary on the bottom of the page that will reference some of the scripture passages. Read those. It's, it'll open it up and make it really help you to understand the scripture so much, so much better. Any questions about that so far? Okie dokie. Moving right along. The Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures, um, they are important, like I said. Don't discount them. There are some communities that only have the New Testament. When you ask them, you know, if they bring their Bibles with it, it's only the New Testament. They don't, they don't spend any time on the Old Testament. And like I said, you're really missing out on the beauty and, and all of, uh, all, all of the, history and genealogy and everything that, that came before um, Christ was born led us to that to show us who God is. So the Hebrew scriptures, they, they also show us God's unconditional love because what happened is, it, as we saw last week, God would send a, a prophet, and they would all get their act together, and everyone would be following God, and then they begin to stray, and they sin, and then the sends another prophet and says, "Get your act together, or you know things are going to happen." And so they repent, and guess what? God forgives. Guess what? They broke down again, sinned again. God sends a prophet. They repent. God forgives. Guess what? Sin again. God sends a prophet. They repent. God forgives. God loves us unconditionally, and he never turns his back on us. Continually, continually calls us to have a relationship with him. Continually. And so over and over and over again, and we see this in the Old Testament. We see how God called his people how they answered his call, and then they would kind of but hedge, hedge, hedge their bets a little bit, and then they would they would sin and, and be drifting away. 
So over and over until finally God sends his son. And we have the New Testament. So the New Testament, you have a timeline here. If you want to look at that as one of your handouts, the New Testament timeline. Well, let's look at it. First of all, if you see, we talked about last last week the Hellenistic period, which came in around 300, around 332 BC. Um, that's where the Greek culture came in and started influencing so much of the culture of the people of, in that part of the world. Greek became the the language of commerce, the language you had to know in order to buy and sell and trade in different parts of the world. Um, Alexander the Great conquers the Near East. And, um, and brings this Greek culture and rule. We can't go on down where we see... Uh, that scripture was translated into Greek, the Septuagint that we talked about, the Mac Maccabean revol revolts that we talked about that are those two books that are between the two testament times. And then Herod becomes the Roman governor of Judea in about 37 BC. One of the things that I just need to warn you about ahead of time is that the dates on anything that we have, we always usually put a C in front of it, which means circa, which is approximately that period of time. Because the, the writers were worried more about the, their faith and that part of, of, of what they were writing down, it's never always very clear exactly when these things were written. We have an approximate time particularly if there were certain things mentioned that were going on that we can kind of look at other sources. There were a lot of writers during that time. Josephus was a Jewish writer that um, we refer to a lot of times in all, pulling things together, trying to figure out exactly when things happen. But you can't take these dates and say, that's it, you know, exactly. So they're all in a, an approximate date that I'm going to be giving you basically the whole time. So Herod becomes this Roman governor of Judea. And then we have the Roman period. As you can see, uh, Octavian defeats Mark Antony and Cleopatra. You have the reign of Emperor Caesar Augustus. And you know, there's that one scripture passage that render unto Caesar what is Caesar and the God what is God. Because the money at the time had his face on it. So anything, any tender that you were using, legal tender, has his face on it. And so that's kind of where that, that came from. So we have all this happening about this time. Um, the census was taken uh, in the whole world. Um, about um, somewhere in, in this time period. And um, if we look at... What we, what we know about Mary and Joseph, they go to Bethlehem, the city of David, for that census. And Jesus is born between 6 and 4 B.C. Now, why are we just uncertain of exactly when Jesus was born? You would think it would be 0 or 1, right? Well, one of the problems is we know that in 4 B.C., Herod dies. So we know Jesus had to be born before 4 B.C. So somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C., we kind of uh, settled on that that's the time of Jesus' birth. So all the people that thought the world was going to end in 2000 and everything because it was 2,000 years from when Jesus was born, they figured they were at least four years to six years off. So we can't go by that. What happened is the Pope around in the 500s commissioned a monk 
she came up with a new calendar. The Julian calendar they were using wasn't wasn't effective, wasn't one that they could use very easily. And he kind of got the dates a little messed up. And it was a good 500 years later before somebody figured it out. And by then, there was so much had happened. There were so many doctor's issues, all this kind of stuff. It was just too much to go back and correct it. So they left the calendar as it was. So when we think of Jesus' birth around the year one, um, it really can't have happened then because we know for sure Herod died before BC. Isn't that interesting? If we look at um, the persecution, so when we see when we see that, um, first of all, if you look at the the timeline, the family of, of course, the the they they get the warning. Joseph gets the warning from from the angel that Herod is uh, going to kill the all the newborn uh, male children, and they they flee to Egypt. And they return to Nazareth. And then we really don't hear much. We don't hear much in Scripture until around Jesus' age 12. And then we see that he was lost. His family was on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And they left without him. The pilgrimage, there, there were always a lot of, of people traveling together. And a lot of times the boys would stay with the men while they were a certain age. And the younger boys and children would stay with the women and they'd kind of be separated. And so it was easy to lose somebody. So you can just see Mary and Joseph, they're in this panic that they've lost their child and they go back and find him uh, in the temple uh, talking with, with the elders and the scribes and, and, and those uh, who were in charge in the temple. It's thought that that probably was, they probably went to his bar mitzvah because that would have been about the age that would have happened that we see him in Jerusalem. And then we don't hear a whole lot about him. Um, we know he was helping his father as a carpenter. Some people think they were more masons than carpenters, but we're not sure. It kind of leaves the fact that Joseph was a carpenter. And we don't see that later until he begins his ministry. So that part of his life is really nothing that we have any specific information on. We come to, uh, of course, we have Jesus' his, his whole life. Um, he, uh, where did I put that? Okay, I think I put that. When we look at also on the timeline, um, after Herod dies, and and then we'll go back to Jesus in just a little bit. We look at um, the the Christians in the early church, and we look at the time when the persecutions began. And Nero, it, from all different other literature, he, he was nuts. I mean, it kind of was the conclusion that he was just didn't have all of his you know faculties. And um, there's that old saying that when Rome, Nero, Nero settled while Rome burned. Well, Nero had to blame somebody. And guess what? When Rome burned, the one area of Rome that didn't burn is where the Christians lived. And so he now had a scapegoat. So he blamed the Christians for the fact that Rome burned. He had to blame somebody. And that really began the persecution of the Christians. It was off and on until uh, Constantine became emperor, ruler, and in 313 he issued an Edict of Milan over 1,700 years ago, uh, which gave uh, religious freedom to all religions, not just the, the Christians, but all religions, ended all persecutions and gave um, religious freedom to all of them. Uh, but until that time, off and on, you can see that when we look at church history, the persecutions were horrible. Depending on the emperor at the time, how bad they were, uh, Diocletian is supposed to be one of the worst. Um, but sometimes it wasn't as bad, depending on what was going on, as it was in other times. But the Christians really suffered during that period of time from 313. Back to Jesus, um, after he was lost in the temple, he begins his ministry. 
somewhere around the age, um, uh, around 30, somewhere in there. Again, it's, it's all kind of, uh, we're not really sure about the date. Um, he uh, begins the baptism. First of all, um, the Jewish community had a ritual baptism already. It was a cleansing baptism. And for men, not only did they have to be circumcised, but in order to become part of the Christian, the, the Jewish community, they also went into the waters of baptism on their own waters to be cleansed. And John the Baptist comes along, and he adds to that baptism the forgiveness of sins. And we see that in the, the Gospel of Matthew, that when John the Baptist comes to the front, what he adds to this washing, this cleansing, this baptism, is the forgiveness of sins. And when asked if he is the Messiah, the Savior to come, he said, no, he wasn't. He will come to baptize not only with water, but with fire. So with the Holy Spirit, too. So John is the one that's the, the four, you know, foreteller, the one who is proclaiming that Jesus will come. And Jesus comes to John to be baptized. If Jesus comes to John to be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, why did Jesus choose to be baptized? To show us? To show us what? To show us that. And that all sins would be forgiven. Absolutely. Um, if you read the Gospels about Jesus' baptism, it says to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus came to earth, uh, came to, for our salvation, but he didn't come to teach us how to be God. He came to show us how to be the best human being that we could possibly be and to follow God, to, to have God first and foremost in our life, to, uh, to worship God and, and to do his will in our life. And so the things he did was to show us that that begins with becoming part of this community, this baptism, uh, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk about uh, baptism itself. But he came to show us, you know, the, 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 so he came to be baptized. Of course, John looks at him and goes, oh, you should be baptizing me. John was his cousin, you know, so he would have known him, and they would have known each other. So we have that baptism. And then as we look on, we see that Jesus, of course, John is beheaded. And then Jesus becomes kind of a thorn in the side of, this, of, of authorities as he's preaching, and, and particularly of the Jewish community, because they, they are really, the things he was saying should only come from the mouth of God, and here it was coming from this man, and the Jewish community had most difficulty with that, and, and they were trying everything they could to get rid of him. And one of the things that they decided was that whenever you have a band of, insurgents of some sort, what you do is you get rid of the leader. You cut off the head and the body dies. And so this is what they decided they would do. And so they set it up so that Jesus would be crucified. <clears throat> so then we see the end of his ministry here on earth as his crucifixion. <coughs> After that, guess what? We have Pentecost, we have all these things that we can see in Scripture, and we know it didn't die, it didn't end, it didn't change. What happened was it just grew, and it grew stronger. Instead of weakening it, it grew stronger. So we see that uh, that crucifixion didn't end it. The, the community continued to grow, and leaders came forth out of the community. One of the first people to die um, as a martyr for the follow they, they were called the followers of the way at that 
and they really weren't called Christians yet. The follow is the way, the followers of the Nazarene, something of that nature. But there's Stephen who came along. He's considered the first deacon of the church, and he was the first martyr in the church. And so we have our first martyrdom for his faith, and he was stoned to death in about 34 AD. One of the things that we're not really sure of, we know that Paul was there at the time Stephen was stoned, but we're not really sure exactly what his, his part was in that, whether he actually participated in it or just watched it and didn't, didn't try to stop it in any way. But we know Paul was there when Stephen was martyred. <clears throat> so now we have, we talked about Paul. Paul is, is one of the most interesting characters in the New Testament, and one that um, actually, when you look at the number of books in the New Testament, most of them are attributed to him. So, when we see this conversion of Paul, he was a from Tarsus, and he was a Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. He was very well educated. Um, he had gone to not only school, he's a Roman citizen too, gone to school, but not only that, he had um, was tutored under one of the most famous rabbis, Gamaliel, and th th he was so well known and to, to be one of his protege was really a coup. <clears throat> and so Saul studied under him, and he believed the Christians just didn't fit into Judaism, and they just needed to be done away with. Not, not necessarily killed, but at least flogged and thrown out of the temple. Not allowed to worship with them, thrown out of, of Judaism. Because at that point in time, there were a lot of sects of Judaism, just like there's a lot of sects of, Christ of Christian faith today. And so the followers of the way were just one of the sects. Of Judaism, they were considered like there was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essene, the priestly class, um, different groups like that, and the followers of the way were just one other group at that time. And so Paul was ready to do something about that, and so he had gotten permission uh, to go to Damascus and to ferret out these Christians in there. So on the way. As most of you are familiar with his conversion story where he was thrown off his horse and he saw a vision of, of that he know that we know was Christ um, who um, chastised him for um, harming him for persecuting him and so Paul goes to an ex uh, conversion experience he's blinded for a while he goes into town has time to reflect and discern and pray and and then God sends someone to to open his eyes and he begins to see that Jesus is the Messiah Jesus is the one that's been promised and he becomes an ardent follower of Christ um, and we, we see that in, in, in his writings <clears throat> It takes him a while because, first of all, they don't trust him. I mean, he was out to do him in, so it took quite a while for them to accept him. And when he finally goes to Jerusalem, Peter doesn't want to see him right away. He has a hard time kind of giving in. But he finally convinces them that he is, you know, he has had a conversion experience, and he does become the apostle to the Gentiles. <clears throat> There's a whole sheet on Paul in there. You can read it when you get a chance. And on the other side, it, it kind of breaks down his life and his journeys. You can read an awful lot about Paul in the Acts of the Apostles. And one of the things that, I mean, he was a stubborn person. He really was. He would go into a town. had an interesting personality. I'd love to have met him. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he followed his faith. And one of the the things he, he truly believed in was the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would lead you and guide you where you need to go. And you can see that when you, when you read the Acts of the Apostles. 
he'll be ready to go someplace and the Holy Spirit says no and he leaves him and follows what the Holy Spirit says and goes somewhere else. What he does on his different journeys, he has three main missionary journeys, and he basically goes to, to, to the, the main center, and so he, he turns parts of Jerusalem, and he goes to all these different places, which wasn't easy to do in that day and age. I mean, you couldn't just hop a plane and go somewhere. You had to take a long boat ride or go by some sort of a land convenience and, and transport. So all of these journeys were took time and were not the easiest thing. Um, but he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and his conversion experience led him to want to preach to those who were um, out, you know, and had never heard who Jesus is. And one of the things he'd do is he'd go to different communities. And he would start by going to the Jewish synagogue. If they would listen to him, he would preach, and some of them did and some didn't. And if they didn't, then he'd go to the Gentiles. And he'd preach the, the good news to them. He was a, he just never gave up. Just kept on and on and on. Interesting, interesting uh, character. And so finally what he decided was the community, the, the new Christian community, the followers, could not really decide between them what you had to do to become Christian. Did you have to become, because all of them were Jews. Jesus was never anything but a Jew. His apostles were all Jewish. So the early leaders of the church were all Jewish. And to be Jewish, you had to follow the law, the Mosaic law, the five books. And men had to be circumcised. So you also couldn't eat meat that was uh, uh, sacrificed to idols and quite a few other things. So did you have to be fully Jewish first before you could be Christian? Or could you just be baptized into Christianity? So with Paul kind of the impetus for doing it, they decided to have a council. One of the first councils of the church where the church leaders got together was in Jerusalem. And we read this in, I think it's chapter 15 of the Acts of the Apostles. And so you, you see the first council where they, this is what they're talking about. What do you have to do to be Christian? Do you have to do all these things? You have to be Jewish first. So what they decided was Paul, Peter finally shows when he gets up after all this discussion and is, is shows his leadership by saying, no, you don't have to be Jewish first. There are certain things that you just to be Christian, you have to be, you have to feel the whole, you have to have the presence of the Holy Spirit, you have to follow the teachings of Jesus, and you have to be baptized into the Christian faith. So Peter shows his leadership as the leader of it. You can see this in the Acts of the Apostles. James, who was in charge of the church in Jerusalem, kind of held out for a few things. He goes, okay, we go along with that. But they still couldn't eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And a few other little dietary things like that, they kind of held on to that you still had to do in, in order to join the Christian community. And so we see Paul uh, very integral in, in bringing this to them because he was working with all these Gentiles and all these communities. And he was being led to just go ahead and baptize them, not make sure that they, you know, became Jewish first. Isn't that interesting? It was. So here Paul is. He goes to all these different communities, and then when he leaves them, he'll go back, either hear something good or something bad going on with this community he started. So he starts writing letters back to them. And he starts doing this, sometimes from prison, because um, he, uh, he ends up uh, in prison several times. He had a really, he had a really rough uh, experience when he was going through this year we had already left. Um, the very first letter he ever wrote, the, the oldest book in the New Testament, was the first letter to the Thessalonians. He started a church in Thessalonica, 
and wrote back to them. That was the first letter. So that if we're looking for a chronological uh, listing of the books of the New Testament, First Thessalonians is the oldest. So we have in about 51 AD. We know that there are at least seven letters, uh, they call the epistles, but they're letters, um, that were written by Paul. First, the first Thessalonians, Galatians, first and second Corinthians were awesome. If you want to know a whole lot about how to get your act together, read Corinthians. I tell you, that was the most interesting group of people. They just did everything. And because of that, we have a whole lot of wonderful uh, teaching from that, from that time period that is revealed to Paul by Christ. Uh, Philippians, Philemon and Romans. Um, he was beheaded in Rome in 67 AD. Um, and when we look at um, his life, he was a Roman citizen, so we see that he tried to crucify. He had a trial, was held for a while, and like I said, there, this is a long period of time, but finally in 67 AD, um, he was beheaded. There are some of the other books that were written after that time, and they can be attributed possibly to Paul, but because he was already dead, it's kind of hard to believe it had to come from his, his community of followers. One of the things about writing back at that period of time is that unlike today, um, if you had traveled with someone and spent a lot of time with them and was their disciple and knew them very well, you could write under their name. You could use Peter's name or Paul's name or one of the other uh, disciples' name and, and it would be their teaching but they wouldn't have actually have written it. You would be writing it for them and that was perfectly acceptable. You're writing as their disciple and you're writing what they taught. Does that make sense? So sometimes when, when we see some of these, uh, like some of these letters, they were written by his disciples. And so it's they, they had traveled with him all the time, heard what he said, heard his preaching over and over and over again. So what they wrote would be, would be uh, authentic, but it wouldn't necessarily have been written by him. Paul also dictated a lot of things to scribes. Uh, he could do that. If we look at your list of uh, how the apostles died, um, and pretty, pretty, uh, pretty sad. Um, almost, actually, all of the apostles died a really horrible death. Peter uh, was crucified upside down. In Rome, in around 68 AD, Paul was beheaded in Rome, and so the two leaders, two main leaders of the church, were Peter and Paul. <clears throat> and eventually, when the church starts organizing and coming together, because those two leaders were killed in Rome, <clears throat> Rome becomes the seat of Christianity. The head of the church will be in Rome. Primarily because both Peter and Paul died there. So we have all of the different ones. You can look through this list. The only one who died a normal death was John, the beloved disciple. He went through a terrible time. They tried to boil him one time and he was sent to Patmos and had to dig in the mines and do all kinds of terrible labor. But he lived to, to for a ripe old age and died of natural causes. Of all the apostles, he's the only one that died of natural causes. So I thought it was kind of interesting to read. So Peter is crucified upside down and you can read about the other apostles and what happened to them. As we go along in time, one of the things that, that happened is that um, the temple is destroyed in 70 AD. 
Now, interestingly enough, when this happened, um, the, there were no Christians in Jerusalem at the time that Jerusalem was uh, absolutely devastated and the temple destroyed. It's because if, if you read um, from um, Matthew and Luke, there they could see that, first of all, Rome had sent, there was a lot of dissension coming out of Jerusalem. And so Rome sent a whole cordon of, of, of uh, troops, and they kind of surrounded uh, Jerusalem and sort of, but didn't complete the act. They didn't go in and destroy Jerusalem, and they went away. But the threats kept happening and happening and happening. And the, Jew, the Christian community sees in, in, in the revelation that was given to them is that the, this, there was going to be a disaster. It would, it would be destroyed, and Jerusalem would be destroyed. And so they should leave and flee to the mountains, which they did at that time. So about this time before, uh, before the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem, devastated, uh, there were no Christians living in there at that time. It's just kind of an interesting little aside. But this this happened that from this point on, the Jewish community was just devastated. God lived in the temple. That was God's dwelling place was the temple. And now there was only one wall left. It was totally destroyed by the Romans. And the city had been under siege for a long period of time, and people were starving, and some left and went to Masada, and they were, those ended up committing suicide. It was horrible, a horrible time for the, for the Jewish people. Um, and so they had to determine what, what they were going to do. <clears throat> so one of the things they did <clears throat> is they got together in a little town called Jamnia. Um, is that on your timeline? <clears throat> 70 AD. So they, they got together um, after the temple was destroyed in about 90 AD. And what they determined was that the followers of the way, which became the Christians, were just a little too far afield of what what Jewish um, teachings and the law were all about. They were just too focused on this Messiah coming, which they didn't believe he was the Messiah, and they were following his teaching and not really following the law. So basically, they threw the Jewish, the Christians out of the Jewish community and the temple, and John's community left and went to Ephesus. So in the meantime, we have, uh, we're looking at the politics <coughs> of the time. Um, Stephen was stoned stone, stone to death. We have Paul that had become, Saul becomes Paul in the council and the writings. Um, Roman persecution of the church uh, was beginning off and on. Paul was beheaded. Peter was killed. Temple was destroyed. And so the followers of the way, um, if, if we read from the end of scripture, they were told to go out and preach. So if we look at the gospel, I think it's Matthew. Commissioning of the disciples. This is at the time of the ascension. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain, and this is Matthew 28, beginning with verse 16, page 70 in the New Testament. 70. The eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. And Jesus approached and said to them, 
All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the age. So what does Jesus tell his disciples, his apostles to do? go out and preach, to teach the good news. Nowhere did he say, go out and write this down. He said, go out. So at the beginning, they went out and everything was oral. Everything they did is they taught, they traveled to different communities, just like Paul had, and taught. They taught what Jesus had told them, taught about the, the resurrection and the belief in the resurrection. And the good news, teaching the good news. By the way, gospel means good news. <clears throat> Writing wasn't a priority, and you could read. I mean, reading wasn't anything that the most of the community knew how to do. Well, they had scribes, and they they would read to them, and the the, the upper class learned how to read, but none of the regular people knew how to read. So nothing was written down. Everything was oral. The other thing was, Jesus promised he would come again. And they thought the second coming would be in their lifetime. And so there wasn't any need to put anything down. Everything was being taught to them orally. So we have this oral tradition. And without anything written down, without any scripture, without anything that they could hold on to like that, except what they had heard, this, this good news, this word. Uh, the church thrived. They, they gathered together. They told the story. This is what Jesus said. This is what he did. This is where we went with him. All of the stories, just like we hear the stories uh, when we get together for worship. They had the breaking of the bread. They came together. Had, had that communion, had that communion meal, uh, sharing together, breaking bread. <clears throat> they taught the converts. They had converts coming to them all the time wanting to be part. How do we become a Christian? What is this that you have that I want to have? Like the song says, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. There was something that they had that people wanted. So they had converts. They had lots of converts. And they lived their faith, all with oral tradition. This is all they had until things started being written down. Because as, as we remember, Paul didn't start writing his letters until the 50s. Jesus died somewhere around 30 or before, somewhere around. He had, people didn't live hardly more than 40 years. So that was like half of a lifetime before anything, any of the letters started being written. But they had this oral tradition. They had the church. So why did they start writing it down? Well, first of all, it was Paul. Paul was writing his letters. So what the churches would, would do eventually is they kind of found out that, you know, Paul wrote a letter to them and then they started sharing those letters around. And so when the different communities would get together or the leadership or they'd travel from one day or other, they'd hear what Paul said, because it would be read to them. And then they would come back and they'd want to share it with their community. So Paul wrote to those churches. Again, a lot of times, the things Paul wrote from prison are the best. Jesus hadn't come again. He hadn't come again. So they were still, they were having to continue this faith going on without his second coming. And they're beginning to realize it might not come in their lifetime. And people are beginning to die. And so they were, you know, looking at things a little differently. But they still, they had this oral tradition, this strong faith, this belief in Christ and what he had taught them. The apostles started dying off. Those who had actually walked with Jesus and knew him were beginning to die off. And so what they did is 
what is to preserve this authentic testimony? <clears throat> and they were realizing that time was going to keep going by. And so from this oral tradition, they started writing. They started writing these things down. They took Paul's letters, but then we start seeing the Gospels being written. So the different books, from 51 AD to his death, we have Paul's letters that were written. Now, all of these dates are not firm, but somewhere around 70 AD, you see the Gospel of Mark. It's believed that Mark was the first gospel that was written. It's one of the shortest, and it was written during times of persecution because Mark says often through his gospel, uh, and don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody, don't tell anybody. They had to be really careful because they were still in this time of great persecution. And so you, they had to be careful what they wrote. So we have Mark, and Father Brannan used him a lot when he was doing a class on who Jesus is, reading him. Then we have somewhere around 85, the Gospel of Matthew, and then Luke comes along about that very same time. These three Gospels are very interesting. They're called the Synoptic Gospels, which means you see them with one eye, one, one way of looking at them synoptic, uh, with one vision, one eye. And that's because it's believed that someone had written down some of the parables, some of the stories that Jesus had said, and it, it's a, the German word for it is, is it's called the Chusos, which is 12, which just means force. And they, so they believe this, there was things that they could draw from that somebody had you know, started writing some of these things down, not in, in a gospel form or anything, just tell, writing the stories down. Because we see in these three gospels some of the very same stories that happen, you know, a little different nuance on it coming from a different writer, but you can see it's the same parable, the same story. So they know they have that source, and that probably Matthew and Luke also had Mark <clears throat> as one of their sources. Plus, they had different sources that they pulled from oral tradition that they had heard. So those three kind of are alike, and they're called the synoptic gospels, those three. And Luke has like part two, which is he, he, needed to, he wanted to write down, well, how was the early church? How did the early church respond? What were some of the things they did? And we see that in the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> the letter of the Hebrews was written somewhere around 80 or 90. Um, then there were some other, the other books, the James, John 1, 2, and 3, 1st and 2nd Peter. Those are really interesting because those were not written to one particular community, but to the Christian community as a whole. Whereas some of Paul's letters, you know, are addressed specifically to one one particular community that he had started, one church that he had started in a particular location. These are all written to the general Christian community. And then we have the book of Revelation, which is really interesting. Some people are just really scared of that book. Um, they look at it and kind of like, ooh, mainly because it's, it's apocalyptic literature. Um, the book of Daniel is also apocalyptic. And what it means, it was written during a time of crisis. During the persecution, a time of crisis. And so it's written in a coded form. And you have to know what the code means in order to understand it. The closest I can get to it is when texting first started, um, everybody started using these cute little letters to mean something, like BFF best friend forever, and, and you know, L11, like have an L in whatever, you know, H, and, and then kids started getting together, and they started kind of coming up with their own, so their parents wouldn't know, it's like parent room or something, you know, they, they would start using these codes, and that's what the, the 
people did that were writing the book of, of Revelation, John, is that if you're being persecuted, you don't want the authorities to know what you're writing if you're trying to write to your community and kind of give them hope and, and you know, don't give up, God's in charge, everything will be good. And you're writing that, so they wrote it in code. And you just have to know, it's kind of like those letters. I didn't know what they meant for a long time, you know. People are texting all kinds of cute people to say, and now we've got emojis that are going all over. Um, <coughs> somebody did a, a show at night where you put all these emojis down and you try to figure out what they're saying by just looking at the emoji. That's kind of what you're dealing with with the book of Revelation. It's not a, it's not a scary book. It's a book of hope. It's that God's in charge, and he knows what's going on, and yeah, it's kind of bad right now, but it's going to get better, and he knows it. He's in charge of this. And so they gave him this hope. Then we have the Gospel of John, <clears throat> and there's a little bit of uh, uh, different people have different ideas exactly when John was written, but because it, it is Within John, you see, they have had time to really experience who is Christ. And, and you know, who was it? It's not, they weren't asking, they were thinking, this is what it's all about. And, it, and it's just the deepness of this relationship with Jesus that we see in the Gospel of John more than we see in the other Gospels. It's really interesting. You can tell when you look at the New Testament, what's the first book? What's the first book in our New Testament? Matthew. Now then, we know Matthew wasn't written first. Should, if you did it chronologically, it'd be first Thessalonians. But we put the, it's just like the, the Jewish people put the five books of the Torah in some place, kind of hold them in high regard. Because these four Gospels tell us the life as much as we can know about who Christ is. They're put in high regard. And Matthew was written to the Jewish converts and was used in a lot of the celebrations that they had, whether it was a baptismal celebration or a mass or whatever. And because of that, it kind of got elevated to one of the more important of the, of the Gospels. And so we see it first. So Matthew was put first, even though it was written Way down there. So, and and then then we, but the, we'd see all four gospels put together because they talk about the life of Christ. Again, they're not a biography. <clears throat> they're not a biography because in most biographies you say, "What does the person look like?" Do we know what Jesus looked like? Do we know how tall he was? What color his skin? What color his eyes? Nowhere in these in these four gospels do we hear or can we see what Jesus really looked like? Because why? That wasn't important. It's what he taught and what he preached. Do we have to go? I'm not I'm okay. We'll feel better. We'll pray for you, Pat. So, you know. That's, that's not what these books are about. Yet, this is where we see and we learn the most about the life of, of Christ, right? Is from these four Gospels. So, the canon. How did it get put together, the New Testament? First of all, we had the rural tradition. We had the church that was growing and expanding and doing very well. Edith of Milan gave, gave the church the... Uh, freedom to come out of worship. They were hiding and doing mass down in the catacombs and different things like that. And, and so they came out with the Edith and Milan. And now they can celebrate anywhere and come together. And so what the churches did, they, like I told you before, they kind of started sharing Paul's letters. And about 150, they started gathering the Gospels together and putting them together. And um, then around 180, they put the epistles, the letters, and the gospel, they're starting to put them together in one story. But they still hadn't come together and decided what books belong in the New Testament.
Interestingly enough, it was the church, the Catholic church, the church at the time, that determined which books were actually belonged in the canon. And what they did is they used different criteria on how to do it. First of all, it had to contain important doctrine, authentic teaching that came from the apostles the apostolic tradition, the teaching. Um, it had to be able to be traced back to the apostles and during that time and the preaching and teaching of those things. And it had to faithfully reflect the authentic teaching of Christ. His miracles had to be authentic. There was one book, the Gospel of James, I think, where Jesus as a child takes clay and molds it into a bird breathes on it and the bird flies away. It was kind of like a magic trick. It's things like that that wasn't authentic to, the, to what Jesus did in his life. And so they took these different criteria and they went through all of the, the writings that they had available at that time and determined which ones were belonged in scripture and which ones didn't. And they've never been questioned until today. I mean, up until today, there are 27 books that's accepted by all Christian denominations of those 27 books that claim, claim the church. But it was the church <coughs> from the oral tradition. We read in, in the end of the Gospel of John that everything Jesus said and did, we don't have room to put it down. So what we have is the oral tradition to go with it. We still have the teaching of the church in the oral tradition along with the scriptures that we've accepted are of the canon of the church. And so it they go together. It didn't it didn't show that we didn't need the oral tradition because the oral tradition we have in addition to scripture. So the two councils in three ninety three and three ninety seven actually are the ones that selected these twenty seven books. And like I said last week, although that all this wasn't ratified until after the Reformation, particularly because of those seven books in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so the Council of Trent determined there would be, there are 73 books in the authentic canon of Scripture. The four evangelists, when we look at, we will see the, the different um, symbols that are used for, for the four. If Matthew is in the form of a man, the human nature of Christ, uh, the divine man. We see in Mark the winged lion, the royal dignity of Christ. In Luke, the winged ox, the sacrificial aspect of Christ's life. And in John, the rising eagle, his gaze sweeps further into the mysteries of heaven. That richness of, of the Gospel of John. Again, the Bible is God's revelation. The New Testament didn't come before the church, but from the Spirit, and it's the Holy Spirit that guides the church. And as it comes from that church, the first generations of Christians, again, had no written New Testament, but they were the church. The truth is the church today. And traditions do not contradict the Bible. They support it. So this oral tradition we have supports the Bible. They, they go together. They work together. They don't conflict. When we look at the Bible as a whole, we look at the, the bookends of the Bible. Genesis, the first book, talks about the creation of everything as human, human beings and that they're good. And the, the beautiful story of creation in the beginning. And then we have that book of Revelation, that book of hope that, that things could happen. We see in the end of it, it's going to be a new, when Jesus comes again, the second coming, it's going to be a new universe. The heavenly Jerusalem descends and the new Jerusalem ascends. And then it completely weds one another. In the supper of the Lamb, the Lamb and the church, Christ and his church, Come together like in a wedding ceremony. And God will have a 
Amen. They knew what he was doing. I said, I can't say that. We had a verse with them with a revelation of Jesus about about the end of the world when when Christ comes again. It's a beautiful book. A beautiful book of us. Let's read John. I was just talking about it. Let's read John 21, verses 24 and 25. Chapter 21, verse 24 and 25. Who has it and would like to read it? 24 and 25. And of John. Is that John 26? Yeah. Stacy, you want to read it? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Jesus testified to these things and his And you know that his testimony is true. There are also many other things that Jesus did, but if these were to be described individually, I do not think the whole world would contain the book that would be written. Well, we see at the end of the Gospel of John that, like he says, we need the oral tradition too, that there's just not enough room to write down everything Jesus said and did. And what we have is the church. We see in, the, in chapter 16 of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus knew we needed a church. Jesus knew we needed this ability to come together, that we needed a leadership, we needed the, the teaching of the apostles handed down authentically down through the ages. And he promised that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The church would be would live on forever. And without the promise, he would be there, not the church. And we have we have that promise in Christ. Amen. Any questions? Yes. <laughs> you mentioned three Tests for inclusion of books in the New Testament. I believe you are talking about the Great Commission. Make sure I read them correctly. First of all, it, it contains the important doctrine, it has to contain the teaching and the doctrine, the revelation. Christ gave us. He gave his apostles primarily. It's his teaching. It can be traced back to the apostles. There, there are there are a lot of things that are called the lost books of the Bible. They weren't lost. First of all, some of them weren't even available at the time these two councils got together to determine what belongs in Scripture. But uh, some of them, they're not sure, you know, where they came from. A lot of different, you see it on TV a lot. There's the Gospel of Mary Magdalene and the Gospel of so-and-so and so-and-so, and I call them the lost books. But they weren't lost. They just didn't uh, didn't have the authentic teaching that was needed to be included in Scripture if they were available for them to even review at the time. And they faith, the third one is faithfully reflect the authentic teaching of Christ and the Apostles. So it had to go back to that. It had to be authentic. It had to follow through and not be off some way from the others. Because when you look at Scripture as a whole, it all follows together um, in an authentic way. Any other questions? I like some scratch today. I talked too long. Anything else? Okay, you have uh, you time for stats. Uh, okay, did anything come out of small group that you wanted to bring back to large group? Any question? Has anything come up during the discussion? Nope. All righty. Okay. Um, next week we'll do Holy Spirit Trinity. I think it's Father Brandon. Uh, he probably has that class. Um, I did put, I think in your packet, 
the beauty of a complete and perfect Bible. We're going to talk a little bit more about those seven books and the different books that are in, which is kind of a leftover from last week, but I put it here in context for you to just take on the name of the church and bear that kind of stuff. Okay, well, thank you all for sharing and for being here tonight. Let's, let's just end with the prayer that we began with. So let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are Father, the care of our Savior Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. O Lord, be with those who are ill, particularly Tom and Sarah, and for all those that are suffering with COVID and other illnesses, bring us to be with them. Be with the Alpha group we've met tonight. Um, lead them to God in, in your way. And be with all of, of, of just everyone here tonight and those who can be with us. Um, bless them and keep them in your, in your loving arms. And we ask this in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Corellis Group. Uh, we'll bring snacks next time.